Susan Colleen, within the chat here, that's where people are going to be posing their questions and um, we'll be able to see things. Yes. Don't okay. urge everyone to use the chat box. So yeah. again, Doc, just when, uh, so when it's my turn to go, I just share screen and then, and then we're up and going. Is that right? Exactly right. Yeah. And then unshare when we're done. Okay. Exactly. Because then we'll just go to this regular Zoom thing so that people, um, you know, we can see their names and then people have the choice of unmuting. Did, Colleen, are they able to unmute on the on this forum or, or not? They are not, no. Okay, so it all has to be a written question. Correct. Got it. Or if you really want someone to talk, I can allow them to talk. If you really... No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you'll see that people beginning to enter. We could give, you know, maybe begin at 532, give people mm -hmm. a few minutes to get in. It was interesting, Colleen, today when I was, um, accessing some of the sessions, like sometimes it would take you to kind of like this recorded piece as opposed to the live Zoom piece. I couldn't figure out when I was, when it would take me to. I did notice there was a, there was like a little link that you had to scroll down on to hit join live session. Ah, okay. Well, that's helpful to know for tomorrow then, or even for tonight. I know, maybe I could do a little recorded demo and show people that link. Cause yeah, I even had that experience as well. Good evening, everyone. I'm Catherine Matthews and I'm just gonna give um, people just a couple minutes to, um, to log on here. Um, for the Neomedic um, Industry Symposium. Um, Colleen is with us from OGS and Costas is here with us as well. Um, so um, I'm just gonna give it another minute and then we'll get started. All right, I think I'm gonna, um, in the interest of everyone's time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and um, just say welcome. I've been so impressed with the quality of the presentations today and just congratulate everybody um, who's presented already um, at the AUGS virtual meeting. It's been an absolute joy to participate and attend and there's been some amazing science presented. So congratulations to everybody. Um, I'm delighted to um, have a few minutes to talk about um, more an operation that has become really near and dear to my heart, which is a hysteropexy, um, using a tool that's a low profile tool that makes it pretty easy to get the job done. Um, this is sponsored by Neomedic, um, who is the maker of the Ankershire device. Um, and once I do 10 minutes of talking about sacrospinous fixation, then Costas Apostolus, I hope I didn't butcher that, um, it's a very British name, you know, um, uh, is going to be uh, talking to us about the adjustable uh, Remax sling. And then we'll have time um, uh, at the end for questions and answers from all of you. So if you've got questions that come in, please um, take it away. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and um, it's always lovely to see your slides actually there. Um, so... Um, I'm going to talk about um, this small profile tool. Excuse me. Um, I, have a, I have a rabbit in my house, and she just was eating uh, my, 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 my tool for my computer, which would not work. Um, so, um, and then, um, so we're, we're talking about that basically this um, tool for um, sacral spinous fixation. Um, and then um, uh, Costas is going to discuss the indications for the Remix adjustable sling. 
So I really became interested in hysteropexy as a procedure um, about 2014 when the first results of the randomized trial comparing hysterectomy and um, sacrospinous, uh, and, sorry, hysterectomy and uterosacral versus sacrospinous hysteropexy was published out of Europe. And then, of course, the subsequent publication from the PFDN um, of hysteropexy using MESH versus hysterectomy and uterosacral, suggesting that leaving the uterus in place really um, might have some significant benefit um, and there is lower surgical risk at the time of the procedure. And when the five-year results came out from um, the randomized trial in um, Holland, um, showing that there actually was a little bit better result in the hysteropexy group and of course fewer complications um, at the time of the procedure, it really spoke to me that, gosh, did I really need to be removing these little hummingbird uteri with these little small services? Was that really necessary or could I really think about doing hysteropexy and more of these selected patients? Um, and my thinking evolved further that really the uphold procedure taught me about an anterior approach to the sacrospinous ligament and really gave me the opportunity to think about was it really the mesh that was there or was it the surgical approach of doing a good anterior repair, affixing the pubic cervical fascia to the cervix and attaching the cervix to the sacrospinous ligament. So I really have evolved in my thinking of this from a mesh-based um, operation to now, of course, not doing it with mesh because it's not available at the moment. Um, and I think that you'll find that if you start thinking about adopting this technique that it's really quick, it's really efficient, and the results seem to be um, really excellent. And I'm proud of my um, just recently graduated fellow, Andre Player, who's done some beautiful work presenting a video later on in the seven o'clock session, um, demonstrating the full technique um, and also doing a randomized trial that I'll present very preliminary data on. So um, this is the um, Anchorage device um, that is essentially um, a permanent anchor um, that has different sutures that you can put through the anchor. So it comes loaded with a permanent proline suture. Um, and it's got this adjust the sleeve on the outside that protects the surrounding tissues and you just deploy the anchor once you're palpating the ligament. And of course, then you can switch it out. We use one proline suture that goes into the cervix and then we use one PDS suture that we just load onto the second bullet that comes with the kit. Um, so in thinking about, you know, obviously you can do this for vault prolapse, um, but I tend to do a lot of sacral corpopexies for vault prolapse. So I tend to use this tool most when I'm thinking about doing a hysteropexy. And here are four factors that really play into my thinking in women who present with primary uterine prolapse. What is the cervical length? Does she have an elongated enlarged cervix that doesn't need to be there, would be much better removed? Is this a person who has uterine pathology now or for the future? 45 year old with a BMI of 45, that uterus is gonna be a problem in the future. And I don't wanna make the subsequent oncologist job that much more difficult by having it attached to the sacrospinous ligament. Um, is there, are there risk factors for intraperitoneal adhesive disease? Um, is this somebody that I'd really prefer to stay out of the abdomen on? And finally, if I do any native tissue repair, be it with hysterectomy or not, is it gonna fail? And would I do better with a mesh-based repair? So those are the factors that I really think about in considering hysteropexy. So let's take a look at, you know, we see this a dime a dozen, right? So this is the, the classic, most common garden variety anterior apical prolapse. Here's a woman who's got the, you know, stage three anterior prolapse. She's got a small flush cervix. Like we've, we see this, what, you know, multiple times a day in the office. And this was a patient who previously I would have always done a vagus uterosacral, um, and always been somewhat frustrated at the lack of a robust structure to anchor my uterosacral sutures into. But if we contrast this picture with this patient, also a stage three uterine prolapse, but we see here her anatomy is really different. We notice here that there is primarily an elongated cervix. And so no matter how beautifully you suspend this from either approach, be it anterior or posterior, you're gonna leave that long cervix sitting in the vagina. 
So we start this operation when we see anatomy like this patient. We start the approach anteriorly because we're gonna to have to do an anterior repair. And this is a resident that I'm operating with and demonstrating that very critical apical suturing of the apex of the pubis cervical fascia to what I call the heart of the cervix. Um, and so um, we're gonna use a permanent silk stitch to attach. You can see the other PDS sutures we've used to placate the pubis cervical fascia. And we're now reattaching what I call the top of the waistcoat or the bottom of the waistcoat. It's like um, we've, 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 we've done all this work in the midline to bring the edges of the pubis cervical fascia together. And the last step is to reattach that to the heart of the cervix. And this is before we do any part of the sacrospinous hysteropexy. So here we're gonna be doing that obligate anterior repair tying that suture down to really tuck the base of the bladder back to the heart of the cervix. I hope that your trainees fiddle around just as much, um, but ultimately the job is completed. So um, after we complete this, we then go on to um, getting access to the sacrospinous ligament. So here we always attach this unilaterally to the right sacrospinous ligament. Um, and I'm demonstrating that when you do an anterior approach, you've got less room than when you do it from a posterior approach, right? The posterior approach, you've got this wide open space. From an anterior approach, it is a smaller dissection. And so we find that this lower profile tool can be helpful in that scenario. So we've slid it down. I'm palpating with a patient out of Trendelenburg, which tends to give you a better right angle of the device to the ligament, um, just demonstrating the deployment of the initial proline suture. And that's gonna go through the internal cervical os. And Andre Player's video um, at 7.20, I think, or 7.30 tonight, will demonstrate exactly how the rest of that operation goes. So in comparison um, of the technique of anterior sacrospinous hysteropexy versus vatches and apical suspension from our own data, we find that within the first year of surgery, the results are equivalent. But during the surgery, there is a, there is a lower risk of complications. It doesn't reach statistical significance. But um, we, um, you know, we, we have noticed that there is, it's pretty hard to have a significant complication in doing a hysteropexy. And you see here that overall in the upper 90, 95 to 97% of patients um, had success, both in terms of symptomatic absence of bulge, um, anatomic, and then a composite. Um, we've just finished completing a randomized trial that was Andre Player's thesis, um, looking at um, a randomized trial of Ankershire versus Capio Slim, and, the, and hopefully we'll present those results at SGS where we submitted it for that meeting. Um, and we were interested to know, is there a difference in buttock pain? Um, the hypothesis was that if you anchor into the ligament as opposed to doing a suture with the Capio Slim that encircles the upper portion of the ligament, would that result in decreased pain? Um, I'm not going to um, uh, uh, um, share the results um, now because it's not presented yet. Um, but um, we didn't have any severe AEs, um, and overall, the rate of buttock pain at six weeks was 2.5%, and there were zero cases where people had to have the suture removed, or had to have the anchor removed, or had to have a significant intervention for pain. And the patient who did still, the one patient who did still have pain, um, it was not a dramatic pain, it was just still present at six weeks. So I want you to think about um, in the data that we've gleaned in the last five years for the opportunity to use the sacrospinous ligament as a wonderful extra peritoneal option for women who still have a uterus. If they don't have risk, risk factors of postmenopausal bleeding, they have a small cervix um, and they've got that cervix that's not elongated. And I believe in those cases that have a concomitant anterior prolapse that the anterior approach affords you the opportunity to do a good anterior repair um, and to reattach the pubis cervical fascia to the cervix. And we found very low rate of persistent pain. 
So I'm going to turn it over now to, um, to Costas, um, who um, very graciously um, is joining us as an associate professor from um, Neomed Hospital in Akron, Ohio. I had to ask him how to spell Akron, which is kind of embarrassing, I realized. Um, not because Akron is not an important place, it's just that I'm, as a South African, uh, I'm not that familiar with the Midwest. Um, anyway, I'm turning it over to you, um, Costas, and um, we're looking forward to hearing about your insights about using an adjustable sling. Dr. Baxter, uh, Matthews, thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate all the kind words, and I'd like to thank Neomedic for the opportunity to give you a little insight into Remix and a little bit about my experience uh, using this sling uh, over the last three years. These are my disclosures. So Remix adjustable sling initially came on the European market in 1999. Uh, it showed up here in the United States with FDA approval in 2009 essentially indicated for patients that suffer with stress urinary incontinence and intrinsic sphincter deficiency. It essentially mimics a retropubic or pubovaginal sling placement uh, with a small three to three and a half centimeter suprapubic incision to allow for placement of a visiotensor device to allow for adjustability. It is considered one of the lightest polypropylene mesh slings on the market with a pore size of 1,195 microns. Uh, the uniqueness of this sling and what essentially brought me to kind of look into it a little bit more was the capability of providing adjustability, which I think is, is the main focus of, of, of this particular sling. I have found that there is minimal pain and discomfort after implantation. When I initially saw what was involved, I, I maybe thought to myself, is this going to be more uncomfortable than just a traditional retropubic or transoperator sling? And surprisingly, the answer for me and my patients is no. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, operative times and, and post-operative quality of life. Before I get any further, when, when, when I first uh, came across Remix, I was I guess a little confused. Uh, I didn't really understand how it worked uh, or exactly what was involved. And I thought it to be maybe a little more complicated than what I wanted to get involved with. Well, I had the opportunity, thanks to Neomedic, to travel to Barcelona to watch remix slings being implanted. And having seen that really opened my eyes to the ease of putting these slings in. And I think it's important at this point, I'd like to show a short clip, a video clip uh, on how Remix is implanted. Remix female surgical technique. Make an abdominal transverse incision of four centimeters. Dissect the fat and expose the fascia. Make an incision in the anterior vaginal wall at mid-urethral level. Insert the two needles through the vaginal incision until reaching the abdominal site. Check the bladder integrity by means of a cystoscopy. Connect the traction threads to the needles and pull until the mesh is in full contact with the middle of the urethra. Fix the mesh in place with two absorbable suture knots. Close the vaginal incision. Pass the traction threads through the lateral holes of the very tensor. Use the screw to fix the threads in place. Cut the excess thread and maintain the very tensor at the midline 10 centimeters over the fascia. Turn the manipulator clockwise until the very tensor is 3 centimeters, 2 fingers, over the rectal fascia. Close the abdominal incision, leaving the manipulator in place. Adjustment after 24 to 48 hours of surgery. Inject 250 to 300 cc's of saline into the bladder. Ask the patient to stand up and perform valsalva maneuvers. 
If leakage occurs, apply three complete clockwise turns with the manipulator and ask the patient to perform the Valsalva maneuvers again. If leakage continues, repeat the previous step of three complete clockwise turns and Valsalva maneuvers. Continue performing this procedure until the patient is continent under stressful conditions. Once continence is achieved, we can conclude that we have achieved the minimum level of continence and no more. Disconnect the manipulator and close the abdominal incision. Remix, another Neomedic unique design to improve results. For so having seen Remix uh, live, uh, having watched the videos and educating myself on the ease of putting this sling in allowed me to become more comfortable in offering it to my patients. Well, my experience thus far over the past three years, I've implanted 12 patients with Remix sling. The average surgical time is about 35 minutes and all patients for me are adjusted in the office the next day. And this is what may differ with what some of you might do. Uh, some docs will keep the patient overnight in the hospital and round on them the next day and then perform a voiding trial and adjustment in the hospital. For us, I find it easier for the patient uh, and for the office to, to bring them in. It, it gives us a little more face-to-face -face time in a more comfortable environment. And essentially the bladder is filled with 300 cc's of normal saline and the patient is asked to stand up uh, over chucks and cough. And we adjust that very tensor until there is no more leaking. Once the, that critical point is reached, the patient is then allowed to go to the bathroom and void. And that's key because we wanna make sure that they're not in retention. And when they come back from the restroom, a bladder scan is performed to make sure that there's at least 150 uh, less than 150 cc's of fluid left in their bladders. Once the adjustment takes place, the patient is followed up at two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, and a year, and then annually uh, after, mainly to observe for any urgency or retention issues uh, and to ensure that the patient uh, is still dry. Uh, to date, I have had no patients uh, so far with any recurrent uh, stress symptoms. Uh, have not had to go back to readjust anybody for urinary uh, retention or obstructive voiding symptoms uh, and uh, seems to be working very well at this time. I would say the learning curve uh, in putting in these slings is probably an N of three. Uh, Neomedic offers uh, extensive support. Uh, you don't have to feel like you're there by yourself trying to figure out how to put these things in. They're very good at being there in the operating room with you. So I, I wanted to, to give you some of my ideal remix cases, because for me, this is not a mainstream type sling. It, it's a type of sling that I would use in severe cases of patients that had uh, very, very bad ISD leakage. So in case number one, we have a 65 year old uh, with recurrent uh, ISD for the past four years, wears adult diapers, uh, leaks constantly. Her surgical history is significant for a transoptrator sling, a retropubic sling, and multiple bulkings a year. Uh, when the patient came to us, uh, essentially we evaluated her for any obstructive voiding and performed urodynamics. And what we found was that her closure pressure was less than 10, essentially non-existent. Bladder capacity was less than 100 due to Valsalva and leak. Well, this for me was an ideal patient uh, for Remix. She is currently two years out uh, and not suffering with any urinary incontinence. Now, oftentimes a question comes up, you know, with a patient that has had prior slings in the past, would you remove those slings before putting in a Remix? And for me, the answer is no. Uh, if there is no signs of obstructive voiding, if there's no pain on palpation of the mesh slings, if there's no erosion or any complications, uh, there's really no reason to remove uh, previously placed mesh slings. In case number two, uh, this is a 74-year-old uh, who presented again with 
severe intrinsic sphincter deficiency, and again, reported nonstop leakage. These cases come into our office all the time, right? We, we all see them. Primary care physicians will try overactive bladder medications because that's pretty much what they know and what they can do for patients, uh, none of which had worked. The patient had a history of a previous uh, TVT sling times two uh, with subsequent erosion and removal was seen at a, uni a local university hospital where a pubovaginal sling was performed. That didn't work. Multiple bulking procedures uh, at the local urology office. The patient still suffered with urinary incontinence. Urodynamics was performed with a closer pressure of less than five. Dense scar tissue along the anterior vagina. You kind of examine her and her vaginal length is very short and just makes you think, what else can I offer for this patient? Well, in all honesty, I tried to bulk her as well, and it didn't work. Within four weeks, she was right back to where she was. So we had a serious conversation about putting in a remix sling, and she is currently one year out with no leakage and doing very, very well. Uh, she did present with some urgency symptoms, which is controlled at this point uh, with oxybutynin. So another success story. Now let's talk about the data. What kind of data is there on remix sling? Well, surprisingly looking over the last 20 years, uh, there's over 50 publications and presentations on the use of remix sling. Uh, Pettit in 2010 presented uh, at the I, uh, ICS Ayuga conference, uh, their five year follow up. 68 patients, 97% dry rate and they're Final comments were that this is an excellent procedure, an excellent salvage procedure for patients with ISD and stress incontinence. Looking at uh, Dr. Arando in Barcelona, who have had the privilege of meeting, uh, they presented their seven year data 230 patients, 80.5% dry rate with minimal complications, concluding that this was an excellent procedure for patients suffering with severe incontinence. Uh, looking at Dr. Gaberti in Italy, retrospective study, seven year follow up of 50 patients. Looking at quality of life, 87.1% improvement was reported in patients' quality of life after a remix sling. 90% of patients were cured, 6% were significantly improved, and two patients had failed. As you can see, there were minimal complications which I always look for the urinary retention rate, which was around 6%. Uh, Barrington and Company also presented a prospective observational study of 20 patients. And at five years, nine of them were cured, 11 were significantly improved, and there were no failures. And they also concluded that this was an excellent potential sling for patients that have severe ISD and urinary leakage. Well, this is. Um, could I just ask, um, it, we only have four minutes left, and so I just didn't know if anyone had a question that they wanted. I just wanted to make sure that I gave people the opportunity as we, as we only have a couple minutes um, to see if anyone um, had a question. Um, I didn't see any in the chat um, so, uh, other than um, one that was asked um, about the sharpness of the um, the bullet um, that goes into the ligament, if we'd had any issues with the sharpness, you know, it is protected by that external sleeve. And so we haven't had any issues um, with the bullet. Once you deploy it, you can't get it back out. So, um, you know, I think it's really important that you really make sure that if you're teaching somebody who's new at this, not a great device to use in that scenario, um, much better to use a device that is a suture that you could just take out. Um, so if, if there are no other things on the chat, um, if anyone has got a burning question, please um, pop it in. Um, so Andre Player asks, um, did any of the longer term studies for Remix talk about tightening that was um, remotely removed from surgery? Have you heard of anyone that needs to like do, do a tightening like, you know, a year or a couple years out? Yeah, great question. So when I was in Barcelona with Dr. Arando, he actually adjusted a patient who was 12 years out from her remix sling. And it was amazing to see the ease. I think it took about 15 minutes to do. He was able to find the little tensioning device pretty easily. Uh, and uh, 
attached the, um, the, the tensioning screwdriver device there uh, and the patient would follow up in the office the next day. So yes, I have seen that. Uh, and from what I understand, uh, the patient was dry. And Kassas, I've got a question. You know, we, I, think, I think that all of us feel like you can ultimately make any sling super tight and obstructive, but is there a risk of erosion of that mesh into the urethra with the increasing tension? What are your thoughts and opinions about that? Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Matthews. Thank you. So, you know, when we look at the anatomy of how this sling is placed, it's not just pulling up on the mesh in order to in, in, in order to compress the urethra. If you think about a patient standing upright, the sling is essentially a, a backstop. So when they do cough or sneeze, it allows for more significant compression. Neomedic has presented data that essentially the mesh erosion rates are less than 5% in patients who have remix implanted. You mean mesh erosion into the urethra or mesh exposure in the vagina? Into the urethra, which would be a significant uh, risk factor. For most of us, sure. Um, so um, I don't see other questions. I guess um, Zavi had said that 16 years was the longest in their experience of someone having it adjusted. Um, so in the last minute we have, um, let's hear your patient testimonial. Here we go. Well, I'm here with one of my lovely patients who recently had undergone a remix sling for severe intrinsic sphincter deficiency. A totally ironic thing is I just happened to see her in the office and asked if she'd be willing to give her two cents on her experience. Uh, this is a patient that had undergone uh, a major lethal sling in the past, uh, diagnosed with ISD, subsequent, multiple subsequent perioretal injections, and essentially almost lost hope uh, in treating her urinary incontinence. Uh, and we had presented her with the option of a remix sling. So I'll, I'll let her kind of tell you her results short of telling you her name. My name's Helen Corner, and this has really, really changed my life. I, uh, I can go places now and go shopping for hours and not have to worry about looking for a bathroom no matter where I go. And um, it's just wonderful. It just frees me up. And um, I'm doing a lot of uh, work that I haven't done in my lawn that I love to do. And um, it's just wonderful, and I have to say, the doctor is really a good man. <laughs> well, awesome. And he's so kind. Thank you. He's Thank you very much. So that's a little bit on a patient experience with the remix <laughs> Thank you. I need to pay my patients to I, <laughs> like keep on the Akron are just nicer, I guess. No, I'm kidding. Well done, Costas. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, well, um, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, we are at our time, and we look forward to um, seeing you all at the other virtual um, sessions. So thanks to Neomedic for sponsoring this, and let's see you in the OR. Thanks, Costas.